I wanted to ask you, did, did you play on that record, uh, Sinatra of the Sands, with yeah, Basie? Yeah, I had the only instrumental in that album for making Whoopi. Right. All the rest are vocals. I have the, uh, where he took a liking to my way of playing ballads. And uh, he just selected that to go into the album. And so that was a tremendous treat for him to a lot of times come to the wings before his time was due to hear the band play some, you know. And like, uh, uh, I had got to a place where this was a pretty good feature. So they had to put me down almost to the closing points because it would get a standing ovation nightly for the way Thad Jones had made an arrangement. So you just can't get out there and play on your own. Somebody's got to give you some kind of interference, just like we're talking about the game. Somebody has to get out there and run in front so that you can go for a touchdown. Same way with the music, is somebody has to write it, and then you have to have the right players to play it. And so, and Sinatra, he just loved the Count Basie band because there was no other band could play his charts like the Basie band was. And that was one of his tremendous helps to make him a jazz singer. Hmm. To make him a jazz singer. Well, and we would go into Las Vegas and we'd play and we would have to, after the show, we'd have to hang around for an hour just to sign autographs and please the people and everything, which was a must. You just couldn't just leave the show. And it's not true. After the show, he would relax and come on out. And if he see you over there and you done lost all your money, he'd reach in his pocket and say, well, here's a hundred. I want you to get on home now. And and all like that. He would do that. He was really wonderful that way. But now if he didn't like you, try to get as far away if you can, let's see. Uh, that's the way it was. And he must uh, uh, see in my days with Sinatra, with, with Count Basie and all, go all the way back to where this is when Frank used to have, to have bodyguards and all. We used to have, everywhere we played, there used to be Poochie in the front, Dominic, Jilly, Sullivan in the back. Why the bodyguards? Well, you know, he was, uh, uh, you know, he uh, had a club too that they played, old Cal Neve. And then he came up to club and everything. But uh, these were days that was a lot of people that didn't like him, and uh, you had to uh, be very cautious back there then. Uh, see, we not only just played Las Vegas, we traveled like we played like in England together, and we played like in Florida, Washington, D.C., Detroit, Chicago, and yeah. Uh, he just loved that band. And he sort of like demanded that band. But uh, uh, he would have Buddy Rich or some of the other big bands sometimes. But there wasn't, uh, couldn't come up with these bands that could really phrase and really pay attention to the singer out there and even forget yourself as a player. Just play your part to make him sound good. Uh, I'll never forget. Uh, we had rehearsed to go into the sand uh, almost a month before he came to run down the charts. This is when Quincy Jones took over and everything. And so, but not only that, see, then 
from the New York to the U.S. Theater. We played there with Ella Fitzgerald. And I used to hang out at Chili's in New York. And uh, Frank would get off, he'd find him in Chili's. And he'd come down and jam just like anybody else. And sing, you know. It was, it was the same way with Tony Bennett. But then it got to the place where uh, they just didn't want him to do those things. Just like the president, they didn't want him to play the saxophone. It's all political again. But he's playing all his life. How do you take that away? Yeah. So Frank Sinatra again, he paved the way for a lot of the work that the jazz musicians could get out there. And it was another thing, uh, agencies didn't like to advertise their musicians that played like with Count Basie. Uh, it was called Count Basie's Most Explosive Force in Jazz. And like Willard Alexander knew that if and it was found out from many, many years back before that from Benny Goodman, where their group broke up because everybody was being announced and advertised. And so Basie went his way, Teddy Wilson went his way, Gene Krupa. And so then they didn't have nothing for Benny, uh, for, for Benny Goodman. Mm -hmm. See, and so they discovered, say, well, way we can keep this down is that we won't publicize our gray. Uh, Lockjaw. They're just part of the band. In case if they're not there tomorrow night, we can still sell the band at the same price because it don't mean nothing with the name. And so this was called Count Basie's Most Explosive Force in Jazz. Mm -hmm. So you don't get a name like that. Until eventually, Frank Sinatra came on and said, well, I want to see some of those guys' names up on the marquee. Now, this is when they put five of us up on the marquee, which was Freddie Green, Sonny Payne, Marsh Royal, Lockjaw Davis, and Al Gray. That meant that I could go to the base and say, hey, look, this is time for a raise. <laughs> it's just like uh, one time we was uh, playing with Sinatra in Chicago and from playing Whoopi and everything, the writer came up and the writer said that Al Gray was so-and-so and had a picture of me in the paper. In fact, I'm going to show you that in one of the scrapbooks for you leave where Sinatra's picture was supposed to be. And so the, I didn't know nothing about it. We'd come out that next morning to start traveling with Count Basie. And I hadn't even seen the write-up or nothing. And Count Basie said, yeah, I saw it, and you're not going to get a raise. <laughs> Say, what you talking about, Chief? He said, oh, you haven't seen it yet. <laughs> and I hadn't. But after I did see it, boy, I said, wow. 